1998, the Association of Genocide Scholars, the definitive body of scholars of genocide, passed an Armenian Genocide Resolution. Another petition in the New York Times on June 9, 2000 read, 126 Holocaust scholars affirm the incontestable fact of the Armenian Genocide and urge Western democracies to officially recognize it. Among the signatories were Elie Wiesel, Yehuda Bauer, Israel Charney, Ward Churchill, Saul Menlovitz, Stephen Feinstein. By the end of the decade, the world was weighing in on the Armenian Genocide. The Pope, the Italian Parliament, the European Parliament, the Swedish Parliament all went on record acknowledging the Armenian Genocide and, most dramatically, France had passed into law an Armenian Genocide Resolution. But in the United States, the issue clearly was about power. And Turkey certainly had more of it than Armenia, which until 1991 had no nation state. What does it mean, Dekre wrote, when a client state like Turkey can persuade a superpower like the United States to abandon its earlier stance for the genocide of 1915? The Turkish government successfully lobbied the U.S. Congress against passing a bill commemorating the 70th and later the 75th anniversaries of the Armenian genocide. It was a simple commemorative bill that had no legal ramifications and would, if nothing else, have echoed American public sentiment of the historical period of 1915. With the Turkish denial becoming more proactive, as Turkey continued to use the power of its NATO military alliance, as well as its weapons contracts with major U.S. corporations, to pressure the United States government, the struggle over memory escalated. Armenian-American lobby groups now pushed more vigorously for Armenian genocide recognition. A joint resolution, H.J. Resolution 148, which was to designate April 24, 1975, a National Day of Remembrance of Man's Inhumanity to Man, passed through Congress, but without any reference to Turkey. The State Department insisted that the words, in Turkey, be removed, and so the resolution read, The President of the United States is authorized and requested to issue a proclamation calling upon the people of the United States to observe such day as a day of remembrance for all the victims of genocide, especially those of Armenian ancestry, who succumbed to the genocide perpetrated in 1915, and in whose memory this date is commemorated by all Armenians and their friends throughout the world. A day later, the resolution was sent to the Senate Judiciary Committee and was shelved. The rhetoric of presidents from the mid-1970s on revealed the same problem. The U.S. government was succumbing to Turkish pressure, and the word genocide had become the focus of Turkish hysteria. The ironies were abundant, especially given the intense involvement of the United States for four decades during the Armenian massacres and genocide, and the extraordinary and admirable roles of U.S. Foreign Service officers. The Turkish government was, in effect, conducting a campaign against American history as well, for what had been America's first major international human rights campaign was being subverted by crude power politics. In 1978, during a White House reception honoring Armenian Americans, President Carter avoided using the word genocide, Turkey, or even Ottoman Turkish Empire. It's generally not known in the world, he said, that in the years preceding 1916, there was a concerted effort to eliminate all the Armenian people, probably one of the greatest tragedies that ever befell any group, and there weren't any Nuremberg trials. Carter's statement was glaringly devoid of the name of the perpetrator and its crime. As the Cold War heated up, relations with Turkey were considered ever more important, and military aid to Turkey increased from $453.8 million in 1981 to $704.1 million in 1982. So it was not surprising that, although President Reagan mentioned the Armenian Genocide in a proclamation about the Holocaust in 1981, like the genocide of the Armenians before it, the lessons of the Holocaust must never be forgotten. He would not support any official recognition of the Armenian Genocide. In 1984, when a resolution to commemorate the Armenian Genocide came before the U.S. House and Senate, the Turkish government threatened to close down U.S. military bases in Turkey and to terminate defense contracts with U.S. firms. President Reagan, who earlier that year went to Bitburg, Germany, to pay respect to dead German SS officers, and in doing so conflated the elite killing corps with its victims, had no difficulty acquiescing to Turkish demands. And in 1989, when Senate Minority Leader Bob Dole proposed a bill to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, Turkey enlisted Senator Robert Byrd to fight on behalf of the Turkish denial. Again, intellectual debate was turned into a gimmick, and the bill lost by 12 votes. No such scenario would ever unfold against a Holocaust commemorative bill. President George H. Bush, in his April 1990 statement, called April 24, 1990 a day of remembrance for more than a million people who were victims of the massacres. Again, no mention of Turkey or the word genocide. By the mid-90s, 
Movements to commemorate historical trauma and disaster had become part of public discourse worldwide. Indeed, a culture of apology seemed to have emerged, a sign that some of the lessons of human rights disasters were registering in the moral climate of what might be called a new age. President Clinton apologized to the black families involved in the medical experiments at Tuskegee, and on a trip to Africa made efforts to apologize for slavery. The U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs marked its 175th anniversary by apologizing to Native Americans for its history of ethnic cleansing. The Japanese government apologized and made at least token reparations to the comfort women of World War II. The Catholic Church of France asked God's forgiveness for its silence during the Holocaust, and the Vatican began atoning for its silence during the Holocaust. The Canadian government formally apologized to its 1.3 million indigenous people for 150 years of racism and paternalism. The Austrians began to return artworks that were pillaged by the Nazis from Jewish families. Swiss banks began negotiating settlements with Holocaust survivors and families of Holocaust victims. Boris Yeltsin's eloquent statement about the importance of addressing the past on the occasion of the funeral of Tsar Nicholas II and his family in July 1998 was held up as a model of acknowledgement. With their moral aim of opening up their records and letting the truth be known, major international corporations like General Motors, Bethelsnam, and Ford have aggressively hired Holocaust scholars to research their possible wartime collusion with the Nazis. But there was still one black hole, the Armenian Genocide. President Clinton tried to make a decent statement for the Armenian Genocide, and on April 23, 1995, he issued the following. On this solemn day, I join with Armenians throughout the United States, in Armenia, and around the world, in remembering the 80th anniversary of the Armenians who perished, victims of massacres in the last years of the Ottoman Empire. Their loss is our loss, their courage a testament to mankind's indomitable spirit. Yet he couldn't bring himself to use the word genocide or name the perpetrators. The deeper test for President Clinton and his administration came in the fall of 2000, when an Armenian genocide resolution was proposed by Congress. A simple, non-binding resolution asked the President in his annual statement of April 24, commemorating the slaughter of the Armenians, to refer to the event as genocide. And the first draft of the resolution also requested that Foreign Service officers be educated about human rights and ethnic cleansing by being familiarized with the United States official records on the Armenian Genocide. It seemed to the House Subcommittee on International Relations and Human Rights to be a modest and rational resolution, and it was non-binding. The House Subcommittee passed it by a large majority in the face of intense Turkish government harassment. When Turkey went so far as to send some of its own parliamentary members to Washington, to pressure the House Subcommittee on International Relations and Human Rights to dissuade it from passing the bill, the members of the subcommittee were so repelled by the Turkish statements of denial that Committee Chair Chris Smith, a Republican from New Jersey, was reported to have told the Turkish politicians that their behavior confirmed the very reasons why he was supporting the bill. Several distinguished genocide and Holocaust scholars wrote to the House Subcommittee urging them not to cave in to Turkish blackmail. Elie Wiesel wrote urging Congress to pass the resolution. Deborah Lipstadt wrote to the Congressional Committee Denial of genocide, whether that of the Turks against the Armenians or the Nazis against the Jews, is not an act of historical reinterpretation. Rather, the deniers sow confusion by appearing to be engaged in a genuine scholarly effort. The deniers aim at convincing innocent third parties that there is another side of the story. Denial of genocide strives to reshape history in order to demonize the victims and rehabilitate the perpetrators. I urge you to support a resolution affirming the role played by the United States on behalf of the Armenian people during the Armenian genocide. After passing through the subcommittee, the bill was going to the floor of the House, where it was expected to pass. However, within hours of the subcommittee vote, Ankara warned the United States that it would close its air bases to U.S. planes, including those near the Iraqi border, and cancel weapons contracts with the United States. In that moment, when terrorist attacks were occurring in the Middle East, the State Department issued a memo stating that Turkey had communicated that it could not guarantee the safety of American citizens in Turkey in light of unforeseen violence. The implication was that H.R. 398 was part of the equation. As the bill was going to the House with apparently enough votes to pass, Turkish hysteria seemed to reach a new level. Pressuring the State Department, Turkey told the United States that the passage of such a resolution would ruin U.S. relations with Turkey. As the violence between Israel and the Palestinians erupted that fall, and chaos seemed to envelop the Middle East, the State Department, with Israeli pressuring at the request of Turkey, told President Clinton that the Armenian Genocide Resolution must be squashed for the sake of national security. The President phoned House Speaker Dennis Hastert and asked that the bill be killed. Hastert unhappily followed orders. Once again, the attempt to commemorate the century's first genocide had been effectively censored by a foreign government.
And in this case, a foreign government with a deeply disturbing human rights record. Note 42. In the 1990s, Penn International, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International documented Turkey's consistent record of violence and repression toward intellectuals and intellectual freedom. Turkey had, in the late 90s, more writers in jail than any country in the world. The number of books banned in Turkey was rising. Books about the Armenian Genocide, the Greek past in Anatolia, Christian minorities, or the Kurdish problem today were often banned, and their writers often jailed. These subjects are taboo in the Turkish educational system. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have focused on Turkey for the high percentage of children in prison, for persistent practices of torture in prison, and for practices of genital mutilation and rape of women in prison. End of note. The only silver lining in the story of H.R. 398 was that there was not any demonstrable denial on the part of American politicians. Most representatives agreed that the resolution was just and fair, because H.R. 398 included recognition of the U.S. State Department's role in rescuing survivors of the Armenian Genocide, it was doubly sad that the United States, the most powerful country in the world, could not muster the courage to acknowledge its own humanitarian history. Soon afterward, the French government demonstrated that standing firm on the memory of the Armenian Genocide could be done without great harm to international relations. In 1997, the French National Assembly began consideration of a one-sentence resolution stating that the Armenian Genocide of 1915 was a fact. The Turkish government responded with the usual threats. It denounced the French government, cancelled multi-million dollar contracts with French companies, and banned the importation of certain French products. The French government paused over the resolution before sending it on to its Senate, where, if it was ratified, it would pass into law. In October 2000, shortly after the United States had caved to Turkish pressure, the French Senate passed the Armenian Genocide Resolution into law, the Turkish government promptly denounced the resolution and withdrew its ambassador from Paris. Yet, for all the hysteria and threats, in about six months, the Turkish government was back doing business with France and had resumed diplomatic relations with Paris. The French had made one thing clear. Ethics and international diplomacy could coexist. The governments of the world, like individuals at the scene of a crime, are bystanders with ethical roles to play, roles that make a difference. The perpetrator should not be privileged but rather ostracized until its policy changes. When the European Parliament rejected Turkey's request in 1987 to be considered for admission to the European community, in part because of its refusal to acknowledge the Armenian Genocide, it took a moral position on human rights. When the U.S. House of Representatives in May 1996 voted to cut aid to Turkey because of its denial of the Armenian Genocide, it made an act of moral commitment. The United States government, as well as the American press, media, and educational institutions, can no longer allow themselves to be coerced by the Turkish government. The time has come for the closing of the wound. As one brave Turkish citizen wrote on the 81st anniversary of the genocide, history is waiting for that honest Turkish leader who will acknowledge his ancestors' biggest crime ever, who will apologize to the Armenian people, and who will do his best to indemnify them, materially and morally, in the eyes of the world. Turkey's greatest modern poet, Nazim Hikmet, who spent much of his life in a Turkish prison, saw the tragedy in his country's denial of the Armenian Genocide. In his poem, Evening Walk, 1950, the poet speaks to himself. The Armenian citizen has not forgiven the slaughter of his father in the Kurdish mountains, but he loves you because you also won't forgive those who blackened the name of the Turkish people 